Calvinists love this, but it's a good one. Sovereign. He's sovereign. But you see, you know, those truths, you have to take them for what it's worth. They're good. But when you misapply what like that even means, then you get all botched up in your doctrine. But yeah, God is sovereign. Of course he is. And he's gentle and he's forgiving. He's a lot of things. That's, so that's 12 attributes I looked at over the last month. So today, we'll start with God is gentle. 2 Samuel 22. 2 Samuel 22. Let's go there. That also is the same as Psalm 18. But for uh, time's sake and facil- facilitating it, we'll just go to 2 Samuel 22. All right. Second Samuel 22, verse 36. What a great verse. Hmm. Already got that? Say amen. Right. It says in verse 36, Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation. Hey, David, well, look what he says here. And thy gentleness hath made me great. Do you find a, a touch of irony with that? Yeah. I do. You know what he's talking about? This is the David's mighty men. You know, David was the, a warring, he was the warrior king. He, the reason he couldn't build the temple is because he shed a lot of blood. But God told him to shed the blood. But at the same time, he couldn't build a temple. But it says here that his God's, his God's gentleness, gentleness hath made me great. Can you be a warrior and still be gentle? Yes, David was. He wasn't like a ruthless killer. He was just a warrior for God. But his gentleness hath made me great. I'll tell you something. Someone else, in Psalm 18, you can look at yourself. I'm not going to look at it now. Go to um, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Christ is gentle. God is gentle. Christ is gentle. And we're going to look at the fruit of the Holy Spirit is gentleness. 2 Corinthians 10. Look at this. Verse 1. So God, I'll give you the Trinity here. God, the Old Testament, David says, Thy gentleness hath made me great. 2 Corinthians 10, 1. Talks, Paul talking about the Lord, look what he, about Jesus Christ, look what he says. 10, 1. 2 Corinthians 10, 1. Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and what? Gentleness of Christ, who is present, who in presence and base among you, but being absent, and bold toward you. But, you know, also Paul's letters are bold, in other words. But in his presence, he was meek and gentle with them. And so God, David said, God's gentleness made him great. Paul says, uh, meekness and gentleness of Christ. Christ has that attribute. He's the meek and lowly Galilean. Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in spirit. You shall find rest unto your souls. Um, uh, look at uh, Galatians 5.22. One of the fruits of the Spirit. An attribute of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You know, you should know these. The nine, nine. That's why nine is fruit bearing. Typically, birth. The woman carries about how long? Nine months. There's nine fruits of the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of going on there. Look at two, uh, Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, here it is, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, gentleness. Why is that important? You know, because that's an attribute that as Christians you need to develop. What is gentleness? It's you demonstrating that behavior. That's going to come out through your behavior. Some, you'll be known as someone who is gentle or not. And it's going to be, that's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. I mean, it's hard to be everything all the time for everybody. Okay, I understand that. But I, 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 you know, I'm human. I I, I got it. But I, you know, I try to demonstrate. This is my life verse. 2 Timothy 2.24. I know Debbie will know that because years ago she made a little uh, cross-stitch thing for me with it like that calligraphy yet yeah. and I love that verse she said what's your favorite verse and you know when do you have a favorite verse church yeah. a life verse 
Well, they asked me in life first, it would always be 2 Timothy 2.24. And let's look at it. And the servant of the Lord, this was what I got early on when I was recently, when I was saved, when I first got saved, I started growing and learning. That was my verse that really spoke to me. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be what? Gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. Do I always live, demonstrate that? No. But I would say the majority of the time, yes. I would, uh, I would no doubt about that. But I, I try. I mean, it, I would probably 9 out of 10, 8 out of 10. I'm being honest. I think about 9 out of 10. It's like make my free throws. I get about 8 out of 10, 9 out of 10. So I'd, I'd go for that. <laughs> the other day, I was like 5 G8 and I couldn't make it. I was bouncing. I was going back home. Leave me alone. Uh, look at another one here. <clears throat> Titus 3 2, after Timothy. But that, that's, that's being honest with you. I mean, would I consider myself gentle? In, yeah, yeah, yeah. Does that mean I'm, am, am I gentle? All, no, I mean, no one is perfect. No, Christ is perfect. But I, don't, I mean, there's other a- attributes, maybe the Holy Spirit, that I, I haven't <laughs> matched it as well. Some other ones, maybe, so you're right. You got to work on it, man. I mean, so. uh, look at this. To speak evil, Titus 3, 2, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers. Now, that, that's a fighter, not a striker. That's always misunderstood in the Bible. Striker isn't a fighter. The brawler is the fighter. When Timothy says striker, he's, he means this. Strike hands. You know what that means? Make deals. And then don't live up to them. A brawler is a brawler. A striker is someone striking the hands, making a deal, and then being a covenant breaker. That's what he's talking about. But don't be a brawler either. No brawler. But what? Gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. So gentleness is just another attribute of God that as a Christian you want to develop. Now, I'll talk more about that during the sermon about salvation is a prayer to get saved whenever you said that prayer. And, it, you know, what a two-minute, five-minute, ten-minute prayer, I don't know. And then after that, if you meant the business, then the Holy Spirit comes in you and you accept the Lord. At that point, until the day you die, God is working on you, help you grow. I'll talk more about that during the sermon. But that's, and these are some of the, some of us will have proclivities towards certain attributes more than others. And then God will develop them. Sometimes when it's really against your nature, it's got to be a work of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, you'll never get there. You'll never get there. And, and you've got to say, Lord, I can't do this. Change me. Help me. You've got to recognize that. Like you said, Terry, just like you said before, that the, ho- the, more, that's right, the gro- longer you grow as a Christian and that you, know, you know who you are, the closer you get to God, you see how dirty you really are. Others might say, oh, he's a great Christian. She's a wonderful Christian. But if they know themselves, they say, if it wasn't for the grace of God, I'd be a, I'm not. And the closer you get to God, it exposes more of your dirt that you still have. Light, exactly. It's going to expose it. Not that you shouldn't be. But you recognize what you are. All right, let's go to Luke 23. So the first point is God is gentle. Aren't you glad he was gentle with you? Amen. Sometimes that's nothing more. Just look right at yourself. See? And that's what you've got to ask yourself. Should I, you know, if God dealt with me the way you deal with some people, you might not be too happy, right? So, come on. Luke 23, 34. God not only is gentle, God is forgiving. He's forgiving, right? Luke 23, 34, the only time Calvary shows up in the Bible is Luke 23, 33. It only shows up by word. The actions show up in all four Gospels. <clears throat> but I'm saying the word Calvary, Luke 23, verse 33, Christ was 33. Even God's numbers are inspired. Look at verse 34. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, and they parted his raiment, and cast lots. Well, here's the Lord from the cross saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. While he was hanging, nailed to a a cross, whipped and beaten and brutalized. That is beyond any one of us here. That's beyond it. And he did that as a man. 
That's deep, man. All you could say is, look, I know the Lord did it. Thank you for doing it. Because we get offended at sometimes the, so, yeah, the dumbest things that even though they could be annoying and upsetting, you know, no one's putting you on a cross and whipped you and beat you and then, and then expect you to say forgive them. Every wedding, every counseling session I've ever had, I always give the verse Ephesians 4.32. You take a look at it. It's every, every, every time. Every couple I've ever counseled. Every wedding I've ever done. And I'll be doing one next Saturday and I'll say it again. It's a great verse. Ephesians 4.32. It's, it's perfect. I mean, it's, it helps in relationships. It's like glue that keeps it together. One of my points I ma I'll make next week in the wedding, I'll tell you right now, it's forgiveness. Uh, well, this says here, Ephesians 4.32, And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven who? Yeah. You. So God forgave you, you ought to forgive each other. That's what helps marriages work. That's what helps them grow. That's what keeps them together. That's what keeps churches together, relationships together. It's forgiveness. Somebody's going to hurt your feelings or do wrong, and you have to forgive to the best of your ability so it doesn't eat away at your conscience and your heart, and bitterness fills its void, and then you stay angry and mad and bitter. And you know, if you were in a church that was teaching you wrong doctrine is one thing, then you leave. If you're in a church that was doing something heinous and wicked, which can be, then leave. But you're in a church that's doing its best trying to promote the Word of God and help you and be kind and stick around. Put up with the idiosyncrasies of the church and the members. It's like in a family. Some family members get along better with each other than, than, than others. But you're still family. Yeah, man. Right? right. You, you know, sometimes you you you. You love family, but you don't always like them. Sometimes you love the brother and you don't always like them. And you got to learn to put up with them. And then say they put up with you. Put up with you. See, that's how you look at it. Psalm 103 says, Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. Forgiveth all thine iniquities. 1 John 1 9, one of the greatest verses in the Bible. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us, forgive us, forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, that is, that is that classic reset button as a Christian. Say, I'm saved, I'm forgiven, I'm going to heaven. Amen? There's some churches that teach that, some theology that says, once you're saved and truly been born again, you don't ever need to ask for forgiveness because you've already received forgiveness. Now, technically, yeah, okay, it's true, you've forgiven. But how do you keep your relationship going if you never have forgiveness? Amen. You've been forgiven your sins, but as far as the lateral effect of your sins in your life and on relationships, if you don't ask for forgiveness, even though you've been forgiven from the penalty of sin, you still have the consequence of sin in your life. Amen. And you have, to, you have to ask for forgiveness all the time. I mean, it's like sometimes Christians are so smart, they're so stupid. Your theology, don't let the theology get in the way of you, your practical living as a Christian. Because, I mean, yes, technically, you don't need to ask forgiveness, you're already forgiven. So then when you do wrong, what do you do? Well, it's already all, it's all forgiven. <clears throat> yeah, but you're still carrying the weight of that guilt and burden of, because you haven't said, Lord, if we confess our sin, if, 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 biggest word in English language. And if we do that, then you'll get forgiven. Why do you say if? Because not all Christians do it. In other words, if we should be right. But, and down here too. Because, you know, forgiveness is an attribute of God. God is gentle. We looked at God is forgiving. And when you forgive, you're demonstrating a God-like quality. You may not want to forgive. And sometimes we don't want to forgive. Be true. Well, that's the problem. Then when, you, when it eats away at you, like I said, the bitterness will fill a void. You'll get angry and upset. You won't have peace. You have to let it go and get forgiveness and get it from God and try to live peaceably among the brethren 
as much as lie at what? Within you. <laughs> and, and, that, and, that, and that's true. The only, you know, sometimes you have to remove yourself from a situation. Sometimes that's, that's the best alternative. If it's too aggravating, just remove yourself. But outside of that, you know, use grace and try to get along and forgive one another. Hello. You know, I, I, I told Hannah and, and, and Phil a few weeks, we didn't have a long time to do any, a lot of counseling before weddings, which I normally do. But I work with what, I'm working with a uh, short notice and time constraints and logistics. So given that, one of the things I stressed to them was being quick to forgive each other. And they both seem to be agreeing in that. And then that, that's something that you can, you can never outlearn. You know, so you don't ever reach a point where you ever stop forgiving until God gets, takes you home. Then when you're there, you don't have to worry about forgiving anybody. You'll be okay. You'll be like Christ. But down here, whew, that's it. Help me, Lord. Go forward best we can. Be kind, tender-hearted, one to another, forgiving one another. But as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. And you've got to remember that, that because God, Christ forgave you, that's the, that's the impetus that allows you to forgive someone else. Not that, not that you won't be forgiven if you don't do that, but you but should also have that same mentality. Okay, you know, sometimes you can look at yourself and say, I'm a, I'm a dirty rascal and God saved me. And he put up with some nonsense. And sometimes you, if you're honest and say, if you really exacted from me all the stuff that my sins deserved, even after a Christian, I wouldn't be here today. So I got to, you know, learn to forgive. And, that, and that's a lifetime. To God, you mean, or to someone else? else. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that can be hard. I mean, if you, I, guess it, I guess it depends on the person and the situation. But it shouldn't be that hard. If you're, if you're, it can be, you know, Denise, but sometimes if you, if you love each other and you say, okay, look, I'm really sorry, forgive me. It, it shouldn't take long for the person to say, I love you, I forgive you. Let's go forward, let it go. Not to, not to harp on it and badger it. Because then if you do, it's going to lead to trouble. It's going to lead to a breakup. That's what happens. I deal with plenty of them too. Absolutely. So you take you, you pick your poison, yeah. Either you have peace or pride. You know, just let it go. But that's a good thing to remember. And sometimes Denise, the reason it's hard is because the devil is a whole lying says that you're sick as your sin as your sick as your secrets. And if you hold on to it, we've had many people say when you confess it, all of a sudden you feel better. You talk about it. You you get it out. Otherwise you harbor it. And you mull it over with the great trinity of self, me, myself, and I. And you mull it over until you get yourself crazy, until you finally get it out and realize it's not as bad as you thought. And you say it. And then, then you say it, talk about it, and calm down a little bit about the whole thing. The devil would, the devil would, look, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And then we'll, one last one. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, look at this verse. We've gone over this before. This is a great verse, though, to look at, dealing with forgiveness. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, <clears throat> verse 10 and 11. And, th that, and that's pretty much, that pretty much ties the rag on the bush. It says this, To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the what? Person of Christ. <laughs> means you do the best you can. And when you can't really forgive that person. Say Lord I know I should. I can't. I'm doing this according to your word. In the person of Christ to the best of my ability. You're right. That's the best way you can do it. <laughs> then it's a. If you don't do that. Here it is Sean. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us. So if you hold on to that. Unforgiveness and bitterness. That's you, that you're playing into Satan's hand. Satan should get an advantage of us. We're not ignorant of his devices. What's one of his devices? Unforgiveness. Is that clear? 
which will be will lead to all sorts of trouble. Division, fights, anger, resentment. You know, make a list. But it starts by that unforgiveness. And sometimes you have to just forgive at a distance. You might not be able to forgive them face to face. So it might not be a husband or a wife. It could be a brother or a sister and you don't have that liberty. So then you just do that through Christ in your prayer and ask God to change you towards that person as best you can. And then, and then try to, like I said a few weeks ago, forget about it. Right? Put it, forget those things that are behind. Put it behind you. And don't live in that past. Right? You, you, listen, you're not responsible for what other people do. I've said that a thousand times. You're not responsible for anybody. You're responsible for what you do. Not you, what someone should or shouldn't do. Well, we could all we all could find fault with many things that take place. What should because we we everyone likes to analyze the situation from their perspective, and that's normal. It's human. It doesn't make it right. And we all do it. But then at some point you say, okay, yes, I probably would have done differently, but it's not my call. Let me step out. See what I mean? That's how I get peace. Step away, leave it alone. I offered suggestions. They, they thanked me and said, no, okay, I'll leave it alone. Who's one of the, one of the playing? When's the next game? See, then my mind will go there. I can't. So I can't, I'm not going to fight and strife with uh, going over and over again. Amen? All right, that's God is. We'll get a look at a couple. God is gentle. God is forgiving. Aren't you glad God's forgiving? That's what the Calvary, that's what the cross is all about. All of sin and come short of the glory of God. Let's look at one last one. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. First Corinthians chapter 2. Now I'm going to give you the last one today. Because I've done nine others. Well, Eleven others at this point. This is the twelfth one in the God is series, if you want to call it. God is love. God is humble. God is righteous. God is holy. God is jealous. God is a flaming fire. God is light. God is the word. Um, and uh, God is the word. God is light. And God is, I just did last week, hold on, one last one. Faithful, faithful. That's, that's it. And then today we did um, gentle, forgiving, and sovereign. So last one. Sovereign. 1 Corinthians 2.16. Some, some Christians get, have such a time with words. Denominations have times of words. Baptism, baptism, it, you know, that. You want to you see a mess within Christianity? You can ask 10 different Christians about baptism, different churches, they'll tell you something different. Exactly. Which one are you talking about? Well, it's, all, it's always water. No, it's not always water baptism. <laughs> you know, that, you can't start. What do you mean? Oh, boy, here we go. I mean, baptism, even, and, and, and even water baptism. When do you do it? Who does it? It's a mess even among Christianity, Christians. So it's not sometimes so simple as it should be. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. I have nothing, I have no problem saying the word sovereign, understanding what it means, and believing that God is sovereign, because he is. Does that make me a Calvinist? Absolutely not. Makes me a Bible teacher. And I understand where he is sovereign. Look at verse 16. For who hath made, who hath known the mind of the Lord? Here it is, Phil. This is what we're talking about. Who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? We have the mind of Christ. You don't know. You know what that is? That's sovereign. Do you know God's mind? The mind of the Lord? Well, we have the word of God. That's the mind of Christ. We have that. And to the best of your ability understanding this, trying to apply this to your life, life application, is trying to get an understanding of God's mind in your situation. Got that? I mean, is that clear? But does it mean you're always going to analyze perfectly? No. No. But, you know, we, are we, uh, have we instructed the Lord? No. That's sovereignty. That's God's, we, you know, God's sovereignty is, you know, sovereign nation. You make your own rules. No one tells you what to do. You're not under the occupation of a, another land. That's a sovereign nation. They're not, Controlled by another country. Well, you're a sovereign being, meaning you make your own decisions. And God's a sovereign being means that no one tells him what to do. 
Now we pray, there's a difference in praying and asking for certain things. You should ask. You should pray. Men are always to pray and not faint. So you pray. You might pray about a health situation. Lord knows for the last year we, we wore God out. We're praying for Ray. And sometimes it's fear. And I said it last night in prayer meeting. It's sometimes it seems like it's, that prayer is going on deaf ears. I'm the pastor saying that because I know it's not. But I'm saying it seems that way. Because we can't always go by what we see. It's like we said downstairs in my office, then God has another plan. No, but, but like you said downstairs, Terry, God has another plan. Well, we're play, praying that. I mean, it's nothing wrong to pray for God, heal Ray, and have mercy. But if that doesn't happen, it doesn't mean he doesn't love him. It doesn't mean that he doesn't hear our prayers. He does. There's another plan beyond. Who can instruct the Lord? We can't. We don't understand. Look at, let me give you another verse in this. This is good. Watch this. Look at Romans 11. You don't know it. We don't, none of us. We don't really know that. Romans 11.34. What a great verse. And then, then I'm going to go to your verse, Phil. Isaiah, that, that was Sunday school. This is going to be for preaching. But sovereign. Look at 11.34. Romans 11.34. Who hath known the mind of the Lord? Paul repeats that. Or who hath been his what? Look at that. You're going to, you're going to tell God what to do? You're going to counsel God? God, come on, we need a counseling session. Yeah, you do. You need to listen to me, God says. <laughs> we want to counsel God. Here's what you should do, Lord. Yeah, we see situations. God, do this. You should do this. You should do that. Well, like, we, we all do it. You know, because we think we're going by what we see, what we feel, what we understand, what we want. And God, sometimes in his mercy, allows that to happen. He's like, thank you, God. And other times he says no. Well, there you go. Sure. You're right. And you know the right. And like the Lord prayed, move, take this cup from me. The Lord Jesus Christ prayed, take this cup, and He didn't. Right. We wouldn't be here. Paul says, take that thorn from my flesh. He said three times to beg God. And the Lord said, no, my grace is sufficient. So sometimes you don't get it. And yeah. Can't say that today. <laughs> uh, look at Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40, verse 28. Yeah. I mean, we all, we all do it, but Isaiah 40, 28. Watch it here. Good, perfect. Okay. This is a great verse, too, talking about God's sovereignty. Again, don't, see, when the Calvinists use the word sovereign, they're saying God is sovereign. Here's what they say. And it's not God's will that any should perish. So then if you perish, that was God's will. And you weren't part of the plan. You weren't part of the chosen. That, that's a convenient way to ignore man's free will. He's the savior of all men, especially to those who believe. So he's not willing that he should perish. And he says, will that all men be saved. Why aren't all men saved? Because not all men accept him. Can't put that on God. That has nothing to do with God's sovereignty. That has to do with man's free will. God's sovereignty is, here's, here's God's sovereignty. Here's the plan of salvation. Take it or leave it. Got it? That's God's sovereignty. Well, let me try another way. Do what you want. This, this, is, this is the way. That's my plan. And that's God's sovereignty. So you accept it or you don't. If you don't and you try to justify your life to God through another way, you're a thief and a robber. All right? So that God's, we didn't tell God. You didn't make God's salvation up plan. plan and to, don't take guilt for that. Someone says, that, listen, I can't answer your questions. I don't know about this. Someone who never heard. I don't, let him talk to God. I don't know. And I could turn you to Romans 2 and do a roundabout with you. But I don't know. You let them figure it out. I'm telling you the gospel right now. You're hearing it. What are you going to do with it? Right? I can't worry about everything, unanswered questions that we don't understand completely. But the fact is, that's God's sovereignty. He's laid out a plan, and 
weak. I'm glad I accept it, aren't you? Aren't you glad you accepted it? Yeah, and some believe and some believe not. I mean, that's it. So it comes down to some are going to get it, some don't. All right, look at this now. Uh, Isaiah forty twenty eight. Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? Watch, there is no searching of his understanding. You are never going to completely figure God out no matter how hard you try. Sometimes he'll do what you think he's going to do, and sometimes he'll do a 180. And you're like, I don't know, well, why? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, that, I don't know why that lady down in Florida, my daughter's church, giving birth, lost that, had to die in child, child, childbirth. Great Christian woman. What a t- she, my wife was there. What a, they, man, what a extolled her virtues being raised as a Christian. Three young girls. You know, what? I don't know. I don't know why. I have no idea. A lot of unanswered questions we'll get, we, we will never get answered down here. And you, you get out down here. And you have to just, what can you do? You, you can't, you know. God have mercy on that man, Matthew. Yeah. God, Matthew, have mercy on him and his family, the kids that are left behind. Let me look at a couple more. Watch. Look at this. Here, this is my last couple of points, then we'll stop. Job was a consultant before God used him as a pawn. Job was used as a pawn between God and the devil. You know that? He was a pawn. God told, God instigated that to the, with the devil. You know that? Read Job. He said, have you considered my servant Job? There's none righteous like him. He shews evil. He loves truth. And and because the Lord already knew that he was eyeing Job. So he just brought it to the forefront. Yeah. But when you read it, God say, hey, you want to check him out? Yeah, go ahead, touch him. But don't kill him. We'll work him over, but don't kill him. He didn't say, Job, uh, listen, I'm going to bring you through a series of trials, but don't worry, you're going to come forth as gold tried in the fire. So don't faint or get weary during a trial. You, he didn't do that. He didn't say, God, sick him. And Job is doing right. You can't figure that thing out. Oh, I know the end of the story now because we know the book of Job ends in a great way and he gets restored and, re- and, re- and he gets revived and he-, he gets rewarded and all these beautiful things. Hallelujah. But he damn it, he was never consulted. <laughs> well, there you go. That's true. But the, same, but the point is that my, from my perspective, Sean, he wasn't consulted in that it was God's sovereignty just to do it. And he learned through it. Even though he wasn't being punished, he learns through it. Well, here's another one. Mary's going to give birth to Jesus. Never happened before, right? Virgin's going to conceive. A virgin going to conceive. And then tells her espoused husband or fiancé, uh, Joseph, you know, Joseph, I'm actually pregnant. Mary, how could you do that to me? No, 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 it's not what you think. What do you mean? What should I think? The Holy Ghost came upon me. What? God impregnated me. What? I mean, can you imagine those conversations? And this is what happened. A virgin shall conceive. But Mary was consulted like this is what's going to happen. She says, okay, Mary, the Holy Ghost just came upon her one night. So, blessed are thou among women. And then he tells Mary his plan. You know, he doesn't consult us. When things happen, it happens. And we, we have to accept it. Right? Does that make sense? Here's, and this is what I say all the time. You got to hold on to Jesus. Here's my thought. Watch. Hold on to Jesus. Sometimes it's daylight and we see and we understand what God's doing. Sometimes it's nighttime and we don't see. One of the greatest applications for that is Numbers chapter 9 when they moved in the wilderness. And I'll give you this last thought before we close Sunday school. In the move in the wilderness, they're in the wilderness. Somebody tell me, how many years? 40 years. And they, no, no, they're in the wilderness 40 years. How many, how, how many times did they move? 42. 42 times in 40 years. Are you kidding me? And they, it's like, you're there six months. Okay, time to move camp. And he comes to them in the middle of the night. 
dark. They can't see where they're going. God, why? Shut up and move. <laughs> right? That's what happened. Why? Because that pictures sometimes in your life, it's dark. I don't see where I'm going. Lord, I have to walk by faith. It doesn't make sense. Why are we moving at 3 in the morning? Why don't we wait to 7 when the sun's up? Uh, get your stuff together now. We're going now. You with me, church? Sometimes it's dark. You don't see. Sometimes it's light. We see. That's all I can tell you. And then hang on to Romans 8, 28. Romans 8, 28. You know that all things work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. Right? Love the Lord, called according to his purpose. We know that. We know that. We know that? You have to hold on to that by faith. Because sometimes it doesn't look like it. And just keep quoting Romans 8, 28 to yourself. Right? Ah, Let's pray. Father, be with us, Lord. And prepare our hearts for the message. Thank you for an opportunity to look at your word and some scriptures. And uh, take a deep breath and come in from out the world. Come to the sanctuary called the church. Hear the words of life preached and taught and Give us some hope and strength and encouragement to carry on for you. Be with those that need to be here. Get them in here safe. Help those that couldn't make it, Lord. And convict those, Lord, that have no other good reasons why they shouldn't be here. And help them. So most importantly, Lord, help us to hear your voice and obey thy will. And bless the service. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Yeah.